ship today as she slips in trying to fade into the faces the girls teasing laughter is carrying farther than they know farther than they know if we are the body why aren't his arms reaching why aren't his hands healing why aren't his words teaching if we are the body why aren't his feet going why is his love not showing then there is a way there is to you. You are the few, the proud, and the brave. <laughs> well, we've got some people that are sick today, so we're going to pray for them later, and I know some people have fears about the coronavirus, but uh, you're here, and that's what's important. I love that verse where Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, he is there. And so the Holy Spirit is always here, but Jesus is here with us too. And it's so good that you are here today. We have a very special guest speaker today, my friend, and colleague Larry Rice. Larry Rice is the executive minister or director of Redwood Campground there in close to San Jose, and he's going to bring us a really great message and then share a little bit more about the camp afterwards. And then we have a special close with the kiddies. That's going to be our closing song, so uh, stay the whole time because that's, that's going to be really good too. And so Joanna here is going to tell you more about the day. Hello, everybody. Can you... Can you hear me okay? What? Can you hear me okay? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. So, <laughs> okay. So today's events. Um, well, first off, about the uh, Redwood Glen summer camp. Hold on, hold on. You're, you're, okay. on, you're not on. Yeah, uh, you're not on. <laughs> yeah, make sure. Okay. All right. Oh, whoa, that's so much better, I guess. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about the Redwood Glen summer camps, um, you know, we will have a booth 
outside or a little table outside so that you could come out and uh, find out more about that. Of course, uh, you know, the age groups are a good range, not quite for this one yet, but uh, <laughs> eventually, you know, I'm excited to look, check it out because I'm sure it would be a great place for my child to develop. So I encourage all of you to, with your young ones, to go ahead and explore and that will be out um, just on the patio. There will be a little table um, to talk a little bit more about it. Also, um, you know, with that, as, as um, Pastor Tom had mentioned, it's not that far away. It's only about an hour, hour and a half away. So, you know, the kids are still close enough, and um, Mommy and Daddy get some time away. <laughs> so look forward to that. Uh, also, we have some of our usuals, which are always wonderful events to have. Um, this Monday, of course, uh, tomorrow, we have our 1 p.m. hour of prayer. Uh, everybody, of course, is always welcome to that. Um, this Friday and Saturday, uh, we have the Bass Workshops, which are in uh, Castro Valley. Of course, we're organizing groups for uh, traveling down there because, of course, it is uh, in Castro Valley, so it's a little bit of a, a trek. But, you know, we have the people, we have the resources, and uh, if you're interested, please put it on your connection card, and, you know, we'll be happy to help organize uh, the transit to get down there. Um, I know Dorothy is heading that up, so thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, let's see. And we also have brochures for that out in the patio as well. Something to remember, uh, next Sunday, time change. Everybody is always excited about that, right? Spring forward. <laughs> no, we're springing forward. No falling back. Yeah. Spring forward, uh, which means you get, get to worship an hour earlier. <laughs> yeah! Right? That's what it's about, you know? We get to worship an hour earlier. So please remember that. You want to spring forward for next Sunday. Yeah, so you, you, you do not want to be the one walking in at 11 o'clock. <laughs> but if you are, it's okay. You're still welcome. <laughs> and something extra special a few weekends from now. Um, you know, we're going to have a special Sunday worship, March 22nd. Um, special praise and worship event, uh, Trayvon Williams. Uh, he is related to Wally and Sherry, right? Um, Son-in-law, okay. <laughs> Don't hold that against him. No, <laughs> uh, but it's going to be a wonderful event. Um, it's going to be the whole service. Uh, you know, they're going to bring, uh, you know, as it says, a 12-member ensemble. So it's really exciting time uh, to come. It'll be a, a little bit different than what we usually do around here. Um, and we also, inside your uh, little uh, brochures for today, there should be a little card, uh, a little church on the corner, like a general um, introduction card, which would be great if you could hand them out to people that you come across that might be interested to come to this event, have them bring it to this event so that they could kind of say, hey, you know what, somebody invited me. So it's kind of like a little bit of an extension. And they're cute little cards, I mean, it explains where we are and and there's also free coffee and child care, which, you know, gives everybody no excuse to, you know, not come. But anyway, uh, that's something to look forward to. And also there will be a brunch following that, which we encourage everybody to uh, bring some wonderful dishes for. And bring a little bit extra, because we expect it to be a pretty full event this time. Um, not that our other events aren't full, because they are, uh, but this time... We expect there be a good representation, so please be generous with uh, what you bring, your dishes, and uh, we always look forward to a great time for that. Is that it? That's it. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, we, we hope you'll be around. Am I on? We, <laughs> we, we, hope, you'll, we hope you'll be around for that. Oh. <laughs> well, you might have me and another one around, but it just won't be here. It'll be from a distance. But. <laughs> okay, am I on now? I'm going through this mic here, Peter. Okay, good. Okay, well, it's a new month. We have a new reading. It's called Psalm 85, verses 8 through 12. Listen along. It's really uplifting. And it goes like this. And it gives us a, a, one more reason today for a call to worship. Why we come to worship our God. It goes like this, starting in verse 8. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, so our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. 
Truth springs up from the earth, and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful harvest. Father, I thank you that you are a God of peace, and you speak peace into our troubled lives, a peace beyond understanding, your word says. And Lord, let us hear your words, Lord, not to follow foolish ways, but to follow your ways, which are ways not only of peace, but of righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation. And Lord, we know that as people come to faith, that more fills the earth with your glory. And Father, we thank you so much that while you are God of peace, you are also God of righteousness. There is a right way, your way, and that you are a God of truth. And Lord, we thank you that even today, right now, you are smiling down on this group of people, your faithful people, the people that have come to worship you once again this week. And we thank you, God, that you are giving God, a God that loves to bring blessing upon his people. So, Lord, we thank you already for what's going to happen today. I pray, God, with these words from your word, that, Lord, they will renew our faith, lift our spirits up, God, and allow us, God, to worship you in a new, deeper, profound way because we now know that much more about the great and the good God you are. You are the only God. Any other God is human-made from what you had already made. You are a true living God who has been forever in the past to forever in the future. And we thank you, God, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us and then redeem us from our sin. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue in a time of worship. Please stand as you're able. Your time is up I'm gonna live like my shame is gone 
out of the darkness we will rise and see he is faithful Oh 
glorious day. Called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. have a seat. Well, you picked a really good Sunday to come because we have a really special, special speaker. I mentioned him a little earlier. His name is Larry Rice. He is, a, he is the executive director of Redwood Campground there down in Redwoods, close to Pescadero, about an hour and a half away. My first experience with Redwood Glens was my home church in Daly City before I was called to be the pastor here, that was part of their tradition was to go for a full week and the whole uh, church family to go to Redwood Glens. And it was just an amazing time and I've just loved that place ever since. And we've been blessed to have Larry come and speak and have some of our youth go. And so Larry is back, maybe perhaps for his last time because he's gonna retire. Yay. And he has left the camp in very, very good shape. And so he's here today to bring a message but also share a little bit about why you may want to consider sending your youth or children to Redwood Glen or share that same information with other people. It's a great facility, very moderately priced. Uh, one of my regrets as a kid was I always wanted to go to camp, never got to go to camp because we couldn't afford it. But I think we could afford it this one for, for Larry. So here's Larry, he's ready to go. Thank you. Uh, I may need that. Is this mic working? Testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Time's up. Okay. It is good to be here. Glad to be back again on my annual visit. Uh, we have had uh, an exciting year this past year. We've got an exciting camp season coming up. Uh, be sure to check out on the table afterwards. We've got our camp brochures ready for uh, kids ready to go to camp. Uh, one inst interesting statistic that I've read, and even though it was from a survey a long time ago, I think it still applies, that for someone to become a Christian, 50%, more than 50% of people who become Christians do so before the age of 18. In other words, if you can catch them at, the, at that point, by that time, you know you've got a good solid foundation. 50% of those do so at camp. So it's a good solid number of kids that become Christians do, you know, at camp. And so camp has a very good influence, is a very good influence for us. So I hope you can encourage any child that you know, whether it be a child, grandchild, niece, nephew, or whatever, to be able to uh, come to camp and be a part of that. Uh, we are celebrating. I was just doing the math on that. It, it, I was here a year ago, and we just got the uh, water problem that we had taken care of and everything. It has been today one year, one month, one week, and one day when we got the water problem taken care of, that we had our water situation fixed. So it's, it's, been, a, it's, it's been an exciting year. We're still having issues. And, and again, pray for rain, because we are dependent now upon that rainwater to be able to fill the creeks that we, we get our water from. So it's, it's, uh, it's good to, to have that. Um, and if you are at Bass, uh, we'll have a table set up, but, so be sure to, to look for us on, on that. Andy was excited. The teacher paired him up with Pete. And he just idolized Pete. And he was just so excited because the two of them get to work together. Pete, on the other hand, wasn't thrilled. He got stuck with Andy. And it's his kid brother of all people. I'm going, why? You know, we had everybody else to choose from. Why did the teacher have to pick him to go with me? I mean, I could have had anybody else, but why did I have to get Andy? And while the teacher was giving instructions on, on how things were going to work out and everything, you know, Andy kept bugging, you know, Pete says, what does he mean by that? What is he talking about? Get, tell, tell me that. And Pete's telling him to shut up, kid. You know, did, but leave me alone. But as they went on, you know, the teacher then sent them out, and they were able to go out on their journey two by two. Jesus had put the two guys together, and as they were talking, Andy is asking, you know, wait, 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 what, what, what do you mean, you know, shake the dust off of our feet? What do you mean only wear a tunic, only wear one and not more than one? 
But Jesus had given the disciples the authority to preach and teach and to cast out demons. And so while they were going out, they, you know, the first time that they were doing anything like this, they had never done this before, and it was, but they were sharing the good news. They said, we have a, we, you know, we're following this teacher. His name is Jesus. We've seen him do many miraculous things. We've seen him heal people. We've seen him do all of these wonderful, wonderful things. And people were stopping and listening to them and talking. They talk about it and all that. Finally, one man comes up, you know, who's... You know, knee was a little bit out of shape. His knee sort of bent to the right instead of bending back behind him. So he had to walk a little funny to, whenever he got anywhere. And he came up to Peter and he says, can you do something for me then? And he says, I know Jesus can do something for you. And he says, can you do something for me? And he says, okay, I'll pray for you right here. So he bent down, kneeled down to put his hand on his knee and pray for him. But as he started to pray, and as he got close, and he just put the hand near the knee, he all of a sudden felt a surge of power, energy going through his hand. And as he was touching the knee and had his hand on his knee and praying, you know, he felt things moving underneath, inside the leg itself. And, he, you know, feeling bones move around and cracking and all of that stuff. And all of a sudden, the prayer ended, and the guy stood up and was able to bend his knee and all of that. And he started jumping up and down. And everybody was standing there with their mouths wide open. And Andy just had the same mouth wide open, staring in disbelief. And Peter was just kind of stepping back going, whoa, what just happened right there? But they got the courage to be able to preach a little bit stronger and a little bit more bold. To be able to say, this Jesus, you know, who we're following has the power to be able to do that. And they, all of a sudden you could see that they were healing people more and more. And that they were casting out demons. And so when it came time for all the disciples to get back together again, they, you know, it almost, you know, looked like you know, a bunch of guys, just, you know, kids on a soccer team, all just clumped together, t excited, and all talking at the same time, telling, you know, everybody what they had been able to see and what they were able to do and what, you know, the power that was going through them. And, they, and no one was listening to anybody because they were all just talking. And all of a sudden, they see Jesus off in the distance walking towards them, and they all just huddle over in his direction and come to him and talk to him. And Jesus is going, whoa, okay, guys, calm down. Let, let's go, you know, let's go rest a bit. Let's get away by ourselves. Let's, you know, let's debrief this. Let's talk this thing through as to what we've seen just happen. And so they started to move away, and they got into a boat, started to row across the lake. Trouble is, I think they uh, rowed too close to the shore because people saw them. And the disciples looked out on the shore, and they saw people running alongside the shore. And they were just rowing, and they were following them all the way. As soon as they got to the other side, there was a huge crowd of people already still there. It says, we got here to get away from the crowds, and we, the crowd followed us right here. And so Jesus started teaching them and just speaking to them. And they all sat down, and they were all listening. And Jesus didn't have to worry about technology, whether the microphone was working or not, you know, and, and had that taken care of. And I'm trying to figure out how, you know, the 5,000 people there and how did Jesus speak to that many people in one setting. I'm going, I've, I've been told I don't need a microphone at times. I've been told I don't need a telephone sometimes, but anyway. And so it was coming late in the day and the disciples go to Jesus and say, okay, there's no McDonald's nearby. We've got to send everybody home so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus turned and looked at the disciples and go, you take care of it, you feed them. And the disciples kind of took a step back and go, whoa, wait a minute. Even if we use the Happy Meal at only 10 bucks each, that's you. you want us to spend, you know, two months salary on just one meal for these people who we may never see again? And finally Jesus says, never mind. Go find out what kind of food you have here. That's my rendition of our scripture passage for today. Let me read the official version, because I want to get into that and a little bit further into that, um, a little bit after that. Jesus went around teaching from village to village. I'm reading from Mark chapter 6, if you want to follow along, starting at verse 7. 
Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And skipping down now, down to verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then because there were so many people there coming and going, they did not have even a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And by this time it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. That would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Let's pray real quick. Father, teach us through your word today. Give us ears to hear. Give us a mind to understand and know what you have for each person here. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Five points I want to make from this passage today. And I'm speaking mostly to Christians. If you're not a Christian, you don't have to listen, but it would be good for you to listen anyway. But I'm speaking mostly to Christians because I want to say point number one, if you really want to be a disciple of Jesus, he expects you to minister. Okay? He expects you to minister. One of the first songs that the band sang this morning is the call to worship, saying, if we are the body... And then it goes through a series of why questions. You know, if we are the body of Christ, if we really are the body of Christ, why is this happening or why isn't that happening? But it asks those kinds of questions to be able to say, if I am going to be a follower of Jesus, I am expected to minister. Now, I am retiring after almost 40 years of ordained ministry. In fact, I'll be celebrating my 40th anniversary in two months, four days, eight hours, and 39 minutes. In other words, I you know, got to that point where I said I wanted to make that my profession. I'm not saying you have to make that your profession. Only a few people do that. In fact, I was a year late because I'd, I went to the ordination commission beforehand and they made me wait a year because they didn't feel like I was quite ready. You know, it was, it was that kind of a thing. You say, yes, I am ready. But it's that whole idea that if Jesus says, if you want to be a follower of him, he expects you to minister. He wants to send you out. He wants you to have a job. There's, you know, people who sit in the pew here thinking, you know, I come here once a week and I deserve a purple heart, you know, because of my, you know, battle scars from sitting in the pew. You know, I've got my fire insurance paid up. In fact, one of the songs, you know, he is risen, it is done. Hallelujah. And we've got a lot of people who say that, believe that, and that's true. But it's, you know, it's that whole idea of saying, I don't have to do anything because Jesus has done it all for me. Therefore, I'm just going to sit by the pool and play it cool. You know, have my iced tea and wait for his return. At the other end, you know, Jesus is sending out, out two by two. And I'm on this side of the fence right now to say, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, he expects you to minister. We can't just sit back and do nothing. It's interesting, Lou Holtz was the uh, coach of Notre Dame football team. And for six years, excuse me, seven years, they were the number one team in the country. This is before they had the championship series and determined who was number one. And it was always voted on. And they were voted number one for seven years in a row. 
And then in the eighth year, they became number two. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole media was thinking, oh, the world's falling apart at Notre Dame. They go to him, why? What happened? And, but he, you know, gave a good honest answer. He says, I became complacent. I just got to that point of saying, eh, we'll do the same thing. And it's good enough. And it wasn't quite good enough to be, you know, number one the, that next year and all that. My dad had surgery, and this was about five years ago, four and a half years ago, that he had surgery. He had to have a tube put in his stomach, so he's fed all the time, uh, you know, through, through the tube. And after the surgery, you know, we, we had him sitting, and I was asking him, how are you doing now? And he says, I'm just sitting here waiting to die. That woke me up. I'm going, no, you're not. We're going to get you up and moving. And he's still alive today. Turn 90, he will turn 96 in November. You know, still going strong, still going busy, you know, keeping busy and keeping his mind awake and, and everything. And he's doing very, very well. So, and his goal is to make it to 100. So uh, we're, we're excited with, with where he's going. So it's number one, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, he expects you to minister. Point number two. Don't do it alone. Don't be that lone ranger to say, hey, I can do this, and I can handle it myself. But Jesus sent everybody out two by two. Do it, find at least one other person to be able to sit down and talk to, or talk with, and to be able to go out and minister together. Whether even if it's just the two of you praying together, whether it's the two of you going out and sharing your faith with someone else, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. Because if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So don't do any of this by yourself. Make sure you find someone to, to be able to work together with. Point number three, take time to rest. This is where Redwood Glen comes in, and I'll throw in that commercial to say Redwood Glen is the perfect place to be able to go and just get away. Um, you know, I can't have you come by yourself. At least I don't have a place for you to stay by yourself because we, we serve groups. And we have camps during the summer, and we serve groups. So if you have a prayer study group that wants to come and you know, stay in one of our lodges, that'll be fine. We've got 160 beds there. Um, excuse me, 260 beds there. Uh, we can handle 60 people in the conference center, which is hotel-style rooms. Uh, you can, you know, two double beds in each room with your own private bath and shower and all that. Uh, we'll take good care of you. We'll feed you. We'll uh, give you, you know... A, all the sports areas that we have and hiking trails and all of that. If uh, come to Redwood Glen, it's a good place to get away, a good place to rest. Okay? Yes. But if you can't make it to Redwood Glen, still get that rest. Make sure that you take that time. And this is the sermon that I have to preach to me all the time. Okay? It's, it's one that I, I have trouble sitting and watching television. Okay? I just can't sit still. I'll, I can... I'm, I'm always constantly getting up and, doing, you know, coming in and I'm walking in and I'm asking Sharon, how did it end? Who was the killer? Who, who did the thing? Or who won the baking championship? Or whatever it is we're watching at that time. I'm always asking Sharon to fill me in with what I've missed because I've gone out in the back and done some work or whatever I'm doing there. But be sure to take some time to rest. Point number four, and this is where I want to I wanna spend a few moments on is know and understand that you are a reflection of Christ. You are a reflection of Christ. At Redwood Glen, our staff motto is reflecting Christ by serving others. In other words, we want people to see us, and when they look at us, that they see Jesus. There's a song that was written about 30, 40 years ago when I first got into ministry that says, you're the only Jesus some will ever see. You're the only words of life that some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all that they'll ever need. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. And if you really think about that, you know, it makes you stop and think. It says, okay, is that person seeing Jesus in me? And is this, is this the only time they see Jesus? 
You know, is that, you know, and it makes you really, you really have to work that through. Let me read a verse to you, and I want you to uh, give me the answer on that. I'm going to read one verse out of the passage that I've read. And I've got to find it here for a second. And I read one word in there three different times. Okay, the same word three times. You tell me what word it is. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. What word did I say three times? Them. Many who saw them recognized them and ran there on foot ahead of them or got there ahead of them. In other words, the word was not him. They did not see Jesus in the boat. They saw the disciples in the boat. They recognized them. Part of the story that I left out was Andy, you know, as they were riding in the boat, Andy nudges Peter and says, points out to the shore and sees the one guy that he healed with the knee, and he was running faster than everybody. You know, they recognized the disciples and got there ahead of them. And it's important to know and understand that it is you that they see Jesus. Or the question I ask, do they see Jesus? goes back to your first song. It says, why don't they see Jesus in me at times? What is it that I'm doing or not doing that they don't recognize Jesus in me? But for the disciples there, they were the ones that it was, you know, they saw Jesus. And we are that reflection of Christ. And last point that I want to make, again, is to know and understand your capacity for ministry. Okay? In other words, if you stand up and say the announcement, that's one of the, that's one of the things of ministry, but that's not all. To be able to stand up and be part of the band, yes, to do something during the worship service, that's good. But that's not really ministry because you're ministering to those who are already Christians. And a few people who may not be Christians who are here to hear the word. But I'm talking about outside of these four walls. What are we doing to be able to reach those outside? And know and understand what you can do. In other words, if you've been doing a ministry and I'm going, okay, I can do camping ministry. I've done music ministry. I, I can play the piano. My wife sings. We've done music ministry for a while. I'm ready for something different, ready for something new. But it's like, okay, what is it that you can do that you can step out and do something different? Do something new. Stretch yourselves. It's like Peter had to come to that point of healing his first person. And he had no idea what was going to happen. I'm not saying going out and start healing people or try to heal people unless God has called you to that ministry. And if he has, go for it. But find out what it is that you might be able to do to stretch yourself to get into that next level, to be able to say, okay, what is it that I might be able to do? What is it that God is calling me to that I might be uncomfortable at first doing, but I need to step out and do something? Getting back to Peter, he was the first person to really recognize and understand what Jesus was calling him to do. After the feeding of the 5,000, and you go to Matthew's chapter, Matthew's book to, to find this part of the passage, is, is you know, Jesus feeds the 5,000, he sends the people home, he sends the disciples on a boat out in the lake, and Jesus goes up into the mountain to pray. And the guys in the boat are struggling at the oars because the wind is heavy. They're not sinking. They're just having a difficult time. You know, they're rowing three times and moving two feet back every time they row the boat. You know, the, the wind is blowing against them. They're having a difficult time. Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And the disciples scream in terror. You can imagine the Keystone Cops each trying to push each other, you know, trying to get to the back and pushing. Sorry. They're getting to the back of the boat, pushing everybody forward until that first person sees himself at the front, of the, you know, at the front, and he runs to the back and pushes everybody forward. You know, it's that whole idea of trying to say they're screaming, it's a ghost, and they're trying to get to the back of the boat so that whatever it is is not going to eat them or whatever. 
all except one person. Peter's up at the front of the boat, almost hanging over at the side, going, Jesus, is that you? That looks like fun. Can I do that too? Can I be able to do what you do? And Jesus says, yeah, come on out. And so Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. At least he gets one step out. Then he starts to sink because he's fearful of everything that's going to happen, you know, you know, drowning and all that. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. And I'm sitting there going, that's not what I would have said. I would have said, good job getting out of the boat. You know, you took that first step. That's the important thing. That next time you can take two steps. You know, that, that sort of a thing. But to be able to say, take that step. What is it that getting out of the boat means to you? What is Jesus saying, okay, here's what I want you to do to take that step out of the boat. To be able to understand that I want you to do some ministry, what is that going to look like for you? What does that mean, that you know, first step to say, okay, I'm ready to reach down and put my hand on someone's knee and pray for them. To be able to expect God to do something special. Okay, we do things organizationally. I can order, organize a prayer group. I can, you know, get the choir together. Whatever it is that, you know, we can do. But what is it that God is calling you to do specifically for you in your situation, whether it be a neighbor, whether it be a relative, whether it be someone at work, or someone at school, that you need to be able to sit down and talk with? Who is it that you can get together with whether it be someone here at church or another Christian that you know, that you can say, I need you to help me do this. And I feel God is calling us to do this together. What step can you take to be able to move out, to be able to climb out of that boat, to be able to know that you are being a minister because that's what God has called you to do. Jesus paired them up two by two, sent them out. And that was a life-changing experience for all of the disciples. And if you've ever been on a mission trip, if you've ever done anything for, you know, a neighbor or whatever, it's that special thing. We're trying to get ready to move. We're trying to pack the house up so that we can get it, you know, boxed up. And we're moving to Florida because that's where our son and daughter-in-law are at. And she's expecting her firstborn in, in July. And so we are just thrilled to pieces on that. And we're just busy as all get out to try to get everything put together. And our neighbor upstairs in our condo comes down and says, you know, my daughter's just got this neat little uh, um, fish, yeah, fish tank and everything. Can you build a table for them? Sure. I'll be happy to. You know? And I'm not just throwing stuff together. It's got to be, you know, perfect for me. And so I'm building that and hoping I can get it finished in the next few days sometime this week so I can, you know, take it up to them and be able to say here. Because I don't want to say no when I have a chance to be able to share. They, they go to an Episcopal church whenever they go to church. You know, that, that kind of a thing. So they, you know, I, I know they believe in God. I have no idea where their faith is at. But it gives me a chance to be able to minister in a different way because that door was open for me and I want to be able to do that. Where is God opening the door for you so that you can minister to someone else? Let's pray together. Father, I'm not sure I can handle the pressure of being the only Jesus that some will ever see. But I know that's what you've called me to. And I don't know who that person is that's going to be looking at me to see if that's Jesus or not. But to be able to say, I know that I need to minister to them. That you'll point them out to me. That you'll let me know what I need to do. Who I need to go talk to. How I need to share the words of life that you have called me to. Lord, as I begin a new era of ministry, no longer in the ordained ministry, no longer in the paid ministry, but that I can become a regular church member someplace 
and that you'll show me how and where I can minister to others. Don't let me sit back and just say, okay, I'm retired now. But give me those opportunities and give me the ways to see what you have for me. And for each person here, Lord, speak to them. Move in their hearts. Open their eyes so that they can see who they need to see, who they need to talk to, who they need to connect with to be able to be proper ministers for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Laura. That was very challenging. Well, would you take the next two minutes and fill out your connection card, and then would you really think deeply on the challenge that Larry put before you? Where is God calling you to minister, to get out of your boat, take a step of faith to minister in a new way? And then we're going to hear a really good giving story from Mary Hunt after that. Before we take up the offering, Mary, will you come out up here? Mary went to a really special seminar yesterday along with Laura Drissi. Laura's sick, Laura's sick this morning, but Mary's going to share with us about this conference. And while it was free, because we are a church, we got to know about it. And your giving makes that possible. We had two of our women go. My hope is next year we're going to have a whole lot more because Mary is going to tell you why. Uh, yeah, um, so the conference I went to yesterday with Laura uh, was called Worthy, um, and if you all remember uh, Quincy, who worships with us, his girlfriend told us about it a couple weeks ago, um, and it was kind of very spontaneous that I decided to go. Uh, Laura emailed me uh, like last Sunday and said, hey, I'm going to this, do you want to come? And I don't really like going places very much. So um, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'll go. And I didn't know what to expect, and I was a little nervous. And um, we got there, and Laura said that she was a little nervous, too, because we didn't really know if it was going to be people that we could relate to and connect with. And we walked in. It was in Fremont, so we were drove down. And we walked into the church, and we just both said, wow, because it was just filled with women who were just buzzing with positivity. It was incredible. And that wow feeling lasted all day. It was the most, one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever gone through. Uh, Worthy is a conference that's uh, organized by women for women of God. And it was just so powerful to be with fellow sisters 
and going through these activities, we did a stand up for your sister activity where we saw how many other people could relate to things that we struggled with. There was a panel of people, of women talking about uh, things that as Christian women they struggle with or things that they struggled with and then God helped them through. Uh, there were small breakout groups where we got to really do some deep healing with ourselves um, and you know, really dig into the lies we believe about ourselves and our own anxieties and insecurities and cast those away. And it was just incredible. The speakers were incredible. The people were incredible. All the women I talked to there were incredible. I left just exhausted, emotionally exhausted in the best way I've ever felt. My heart feels lighter. I could not shut up about it. I like got home, I was so on fire, I fell asleep, I woke up, I was still on fire, I was telling everyone about it that I was encountering. I was like just praising this experience that I went to and I um, got a really amazing opportunity. God really laid his hand on me. We were singing the last worship songs and I was thinking, I really wanna get connected with this worthy movement, this is amazing. And uh, one of the panel speakers came up to me and she said, you were highlighted the minute you walked in here, I wanna get you connected with us. And it was just incredible. So I have a really wonderful opportunity to start um, maybe working with them a little bit more, uh, which as you all know, I have my hands in a lot of different ministries here and it's really great to kind of expand that, really touching on what we just heard about uh, talking to more people and telling my story. Um, it was, it was life-changing, everyone. I just encourage when it comes up next time, go, no matter where it is. Like, I'll carpool down with people, as many as I can fit, you know? I just think that every woman, no matter what their walk in faith is, should experience the light that I experienced with all these wonderful women. So thank you for encouraging me and you know people around you to go and I in turn will encourage you to go when it next comes up because it was just awe inspiring. We're just going to pray for you right now that you can get connected. Uh, you know this almost didn't happen today and she came over before the start of service and said could she share? And I had no idea what she's going to share, but oh my goodness, that is so encouraging. So thank you. So we're just going to pray for you, okay? Because, uh, yeah, we see that in you too. So, Lord, we just lift up Mary. Thank you, God, she went. She, she got out of the boat. She got out of her comfort zone. And, God, you have blessed her richly. And, God, we know this personality you put together is, God, you're going to extend that far and wide. So we just ask you to open the doors for her. Uh, what a blessing she has been to us, and we just pray, God, that you will provide the way. And we thank you, God. It's so important for our, our young millennials to be able to take uh, their place at the table and have a voice and begin to be a part of the ministry, God. So thank you that this young woman is taking her place at this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Proud of you. you. Proud of you. So we will go ahead and take up the offering now, if you would, please. Okay, and we have a special closing song today, not by Steve and the band, but by our children and youth. So come on forward, children and youth. Can we give them a welcome? So do you guys want the microphone? Here, Damon, take the microphone.
So if you get the chance, will you go up to them later and tell them thank you? They have been very nervous. I had to go up and give them a little pep talk. And so could you uh, let them know how much you appreciated that? Just a couple things. Is that this is your home church, and you see someone you don't know. Would you take that bulletin to them and share with them different ways? We've got a lot of things going on and help them get connected. Hang around for some coffee. We don't have anything going on. This is an open Sunday, very rare for us. So no need to rush out. Just uh, get a chance to enjoy one another. Would you make sure to use your invite card to invite someone to the March 22nd Trayvon Williams Ensemble event? It's going to really be great, plus followed with uh, a brunch after that. And now, let me bless you as we go. May the Lord bless you and take care of you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and peace. Go beholding God, beholding you, and smiling in deep, deep delight. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. If we are the body, why aren't he? 